Hey there, everybody. It is time for another Chem Complete episode, and today we are finally finished with our aromatic reactions, and we are going to move forward with the chapter of aldehydes and ketones. And so this lesson will be covering aldehydes and ketones. Some of them have, when I'm saying some, aldehydes and ketones, some of them have unique reactions, but usually most things that an aldehyde can undergo, a ketone can also undergo that same general reaction. And so we tend to group these together when we're talking about them. Uh, we're going to be studying carbonyl compounds quite a bit, starting with the aldehydes and ketones, and then working up to carboxylic acids, esters, acid chlorides, and things like that. But to get started, we're going to take a look at the general structure of aldehydes and ketones, along with how to name these compounds. So a ketone has the general structure R, C double bond O, R, whereas an aldehyde has the general structure R, C double bond O, and an H. Uh, so to give you some examples, acetone, which is a very common organic compound, often a solvent, would be this, and then acetaldehyde would be this when we look at that structure. So ketones and aldehydes, important structures, one of the biggest things that we want to keep in mind in this particular lesson is that the carbonyls are partially positive and the oxygen on the carbonyl is partially negative for these structures. And this is going to be very important because when we take a look at the general set of reactions that are going to be happening here, one of two things will uh, occur very often. So let's take a look here. We have partial positive, partial negative. I'm going to draw another one for the other example. And certainly there may be some other ways that these interact, but these are going to be the two most common. So what if I have some sort of a nucleophile or a base that has a lone pair or a negative charge, right, or something like that? Well, the most common pathway here is going to be that the nucleophile attacks the partially positive carbon, and we're going to move some electrons up onto this oxygen. So that's one very common pathway. The other one is what if we have some sort of acid? that's present, right? So it may be an acid that also has a nucleophile present somewhere in solution. But if we have acidic solution, the lone pairs on the oxygen will likely reach out and grab this. So what we really end up with in that case would be a structure like this where the oxygen will temporarily take a plus charge and then usually what we'll see is some other things. So maybe you have H plus and H2O or something like that. Something else can come in as a nucleophile afterwards. And this will very readily open up to give an alcohol. Okay, so in acidic conditions, we usually will see the protonation of the oxygen before we have an attack at the carbonyl. For basic conditions, when we're using a base or a nucleophile, we're probably going to see the carbonyl directly attacked by that negatively charged nucleophile or base. So just an important warm-up and exercise in terms of what aldehydes and ketones are and how most of these reactions are going to progress as we take a look at them. So what about naming? We've seen naming of alcohols, ethers, aromatic compounds. Aldehydes and ketones follow the same general rules. When you want to name, you are going to find the longest chain, just like we've always talked about. And when we're dealing with specific functional groups, we do the longest chain that contains the functional group. All right, so I'm going to abbreviate FG will be functional group here. So find the longest chain that contains the actual functional group. That's one. Number two, we're going to number giving remember this all revolves around the functional group we're going to number giving the functional group the highest priority and when we do highest priority that is associated with the lowest number right? Because in numbering, lower numbers are giving higher ranking or priority as we do naming. And then finally, we need to change the parent name.
And so when we change the parent name in this case for the ketones, the ketones are going to be changed to own, okay? Spelled one like that, but pronounced own. And then the aldehydes are, whoops, sorry about that. <clears throat> the aldehydes, oh, got to go back to my pen, are going to end in A-L. So I'll. You have to be careful because this is close to O-L, and O-L is utilized for alcohols, right? So we're not talking about O-L. That would be for an alcohol. It's going to be A-L, and that's for aldehyde when we're talking about that. So one of the things to remember is that aldehydes, okay, are always going to be terminal. So if you think about the structure of an aldehyde, we have R, C, double bond, O, and then to classify it as an aldehyde, I need an H here. So if I have an H there, I cannot continue anything on the other side. So because aldehydes are always terminal, we do not need to usually associate a number with the aldehyde because the aldehyde will always be found at the end of the chain and we will start numbering from the aldehyde. So therefore we can start picking out the other numbers that come after that for any other substituents found on R. Okay, so for instance, if I have the following compound, let's start easy. Okay, this is one of the easier aldehydes that you would come across in terms of naming. If I take a look at this, the aldehyde here is terminal. So this would be position one, and I have two carbons. So if I have two carbons and no other functional groups, this would be F. And instead of ethane, okay, it would be FN al now ethanol is the alcohol ethanol is going to be the aldehyde and so this would be ethanol okay uh getting a little bit more here right so if i went out one additional carbon what would i get here well in this case it would be propanol following the same principle. So remember, prop is for three, so prop and al would be the aldehyde. This is position one, two, and three, right? So what if I have an aldehyde that has some functional groups on it, right? So let's create an aldehyde. We're gonna use a longer chain so we can get some functional groups in here. Uh, so let's go ahead, we'll put a, we'll do a methyl group up here, right? And then we'll do CH2. CH2, and then let's do another functional group on this CH2, we'll do a BR, right? And then, uh, wait a minute, that cannot be a two, that should be a CH if that's, I'm doing that, right? There we go. And then let's attach that, we'll go ahead and we'll end that there, right? So getting a little more complex in the structure, at this point, when we're looking at this, we would say, okay, how many carbons do I have? And don't forget to count the carbon in the carbonyl. A lot of students forget that one. So I say, all right, I've got one, two, three, four, five. You could count this one up here as five because this is symmetrical. And so the numbering here starts with the aldehyde. So it would be one, two, three, four, five, right? So, what substituents do I have? I have a bromo, a 2-bromo, and I have a 4-methyl. So remember your alphabetical order. 2-bromo because it's a B. And then 4-methyl. Right? And then when I take a look at this, 5 would be pent. And so to finish this off, it would be pent. And, and hopefully you can finish this. It should be an AL here, pentanal would be the proper name. Notice again, no numbering needed for this because it's always an implied one since aldehydes are going to be on the terminal end of a chain. Okay, one other um, note that I just like to bring up here because sometimes students will ask about this when you see an example like this. What if I have a large ring and then I have a aldehyde coming off of the ring itself okay 
So in this case, a lot of people want to call this cyclohexan al. The IUPAC rules or naming will tend to, in this case, they call these carbaldehydes, okay, when they're coming off of rings like this or complicated structures. Oh my goodness, my Zoom is just not cooperating with me today. All right. Sorry, guys. Okay, so they call these carb aldehydes. And so therefore, they're also named in that similar fashion. So if you got ready to name this compound, you would call this cyclohexane, uh, whoops, not aldehyde, cyclohexane carbaldehyde. And so, unfortunately, that makes the name more complex. Uh, I, I'll be completely honest because I don't get too wrapped up in naming. I have no idea why they decided to, to do that instead of just calling it, uh, you know, cyclohexanal, just like cyclohexanol or something like that. Um, they decided that they're going to have this class of carbaldehydes when they're naming if it's coming off of rings. Uh, so just something that's important to note there. Um, we talked about acetaldehyde, which is sometimes these have common names. Another one that would have a common name would be formaldehyde. So you do have formaldehyde, like the preservative is it's a double aldehyde there. That's formaldehyde, so you should be familiar with that. We've talked about benzaldehyde. That was one of the ones from the aromatic chapter. So you can have benzaldehyde. Right, a couple of the the uh, common names that we have there. So the official name of that one would be would be benzene carbaldehyde, whereas benzaldehyde is the common name. I like benzaldehyde more; it sort of flows off the tongue. Um, okay, so that's aldehydes. Okay, so let's go to ketones, if we are good with our aldehydes here. So for ketones, ketones are not always terminal. And so we need to consider where we find the carbonyl. So this was an example I gave earlier. This is acetone. And this name is, acetone is actually a common name. In fact, it's so common, most people only refer to this as acetone. But the proper name of this compound, okay, following the same naming, would be one, two, three. So in position two, right, I find this. So this would be 2-prop-anone. And again, the common name, the name almost everybody is going to use here is acetone. Uh, so we did see acetophenone. That was a common one for the ketones. Acetophenone just has the acetyl group. A lot of times when you hear acetyl, acetaldehyde, acetic acid, acetophenone, this is the acetyl group. That they're talking about there. So that's acetophenone. Um, you could have benzophenone, which has one on each side. Okay, so benzophenone would look like this. That's another common name one. So those would be a few of the common names. Um, this one being acetophenone. And this one being benz benzophenone. And then the the way that you would name these, I just showed you with the two propanone. Let's do a couple of these so that you could see an example uh, of how we would name some of these. So let's say that I have a six-membered carbon chain. So make sure that I do this. I gotta throw a ketone in there somewhere. So let's do a carbonyl here. Right? Four five, six. So if I take a look here and I start numbering, remember you give lowest number, so it would not be starting from the right. It would be one, two, three right here. So this would be three, and the numbers are included because these are not terminal. Oh, well, they're certainly not always terminal. I was going back to my other example there. This is not propanone. This is three hexanone. 
right? Because I've got a six-membered carbon, oh my goodness, a six-membered carbon chain. So three hexanone is what I have there. Um, if I had another functional group, uh, so what, we, what could we do? We could put something like an alkene in here, right? So let's say that I've got a CH3, CH, and that CH is involved in a double bond. So I've got another CH, and then I've got, uh, I guess we'll stick to a, a six-membered example. So four, oops, i got to include my ketone in here too, uh, five, six, right? So what if I had something like this with another functional group? And same thing would apply for the aldehydes because we did see other functional groups like bromo or methyl or stuff like that. Ketone gets priority, so one, two, three, four, five, six. So this will be a two hexanone, right? But then we also have to think about the fact that this has in position four, it's an ene, it's an alkene. So what do I do if I have two different names in terms of the the, the structure here, right? Because this wants to be a hexene, but it also wants to be a hexanone. So the way that you really do this, okay, if I have the two in the ketone position, so I have a two own, this is when you're gonna basically get some choppy naming that comes up here. So I would say, all right, four hex, and then I put en, right? Because it's a double bond. And then I put dash because I, ha I would need to name this as two separate functional groups, two own, okay? So this would be four hexen two own. Uh, not the prettiest sounding compound, but that would be how you name something like that. So uh, what if I had a double ketone, right? So what if I had something like this? Right? If I have something like this, again, numbering should give the lowest numbers possible to both of these ketones, which means I'd start this way. One, two, three, four, five, six. And so I can have a dione, and that's exactly what I have in this case. I would have a two, four, hexadione. Okay, now some people also like to name this, they say, well, can I do hexa um, two for dione? And yes, IUPAC allows you to break it up like that. And we kind of saw something like that over here with the four hexene two own. Um, I prefer, if possible, to keep one parent name. I think it looks cleaner to just put two for uh, hexadione when you have something like that. So that's some examples in terms of naming aldehydes and ketones. If you run into any issues, you're welcome to leave comments and I will get back to you. But that is a very good overlook and introduction to the chemistry behind aldehyde and ketone structure along with naming. So the first thing we're probably going to do uh, in the next lecture is talk about preparing aldehydes and ketones. And then we'll talk about all the different reactions that they could undergo. So we have if you've gone through the alcohol chapter we've really already talked about preparing aldehydes and ketones to some extent or another but we will do a very brief review of this and you can go back and look at some of those videos if you need to so other than that i'm going to wrap this up before we hit the 20 minute mark i hope you guys understand all this please remember to like comment and subscribe that will be the quickest way that you will be in touch with me in terms of material and any questions you have Thank you very much for learning with me today, and I will see you guys for the next video. Take care.